Bible church. You know what I'm done with that. They go home with it. Really don't mean a whole lot to them. Y'all really didn't think a whole lot about that conversation that me and him had until uh, yesterday. I got ready to go to a funeral. And uh, y'all, this was a real close friend of mine. He, um, he was in his 40s. And as I was going down the road to that funeral, y'all, I, as far as I could see this way, there were cars coming to his funeral. And I looked in my mirror, and as far as I could see that way, there were cars behind me. And I was in a straight away, and I thought, man. And this guy, y'all, he was, he was about filling churches up because he loved Jesus. And I thought, man, good gracious, he couldn't have filled this one slap up this morning. And as I thought about that, I thought, man, you know, how come we can't fill the church up before we die? Come on. How come we can't go in there and not just check a box, but go in there and have a relationship with God? And I can't help but to think, as I think about that, that, you know, y'all, I preach. And I get in this pulpit a lot of Sundays, and I try to think of things that are good that people don't think about to catch people's attention. But then at the end of it, a lot of times, I don't bring it back to the real thing. You know, the Bible says in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, it says, He who, he who believes in his baptized shall be saved. Amen. And that's what it's about, y'all. That's why we're coming to this bill. It's that way we can get our reward, that way we can go get and live with God for eternity. And y'all, I hate to bring that to you like that this morning, but let's not be a check of box this morning. Let's praise him for what he needs to be praised for. Let's praise him for that gift that he's given us. Y'all pray with me this morning. Lord, we love you this morning. We praise you. Lord, we thank you for bringing us to this place this morning, Lord. Lord, we thank you for choosing us. We know that we didn't choose you. You chose us. You came to get us out of whatever it is that we were in. And Lord, we know that you love us this morning. Lord, I pray that you accept our sacrifice of worship this morning. Lord, let you get all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Because it's not about us, Lord. It's all about you. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. the words of this morning.
Let's go. 
Go over some announcements with us this morning.
But Lord, we look forward to the message this morning that's going to be brought forth from Brother Levi. We know that message has been laid on his heart. Lord, you've got to be convenient to the message that he's to bring forth, Lord, and we know that we can back up whatever he says by reading the word. Now, Lord, I just ask you this morning that you be with each and every family here, be with each and every family that's outside this church, Lord, that needs a, needs a healing. Now, Lord, just be with us as we go through the rest of our service. We ask you to take this morning, tight and all, Lord, sort of bless and break and multiply and ease your kingdom and everybody in this house, your house. We'll give you all the honor, glory, and praise, Lord, and we all together. Amen. All right, our children would like to come up here and bless us with a song this morning.
Detroit. If y'all will stand with us, we're going to go back into worship this morning.
God for helping me get through this. Y'all don't go out now. Amen. In fact, let's just make some noise in this place right now. Come on, make some noise for him. Be in the house of God. Uh, somebody, somebody asked me last week. I was walking up through the dealership and they asked me. They said, uh, "How you doing today?" I said, "I'm doing great. Every, every day is a blessing." That's what I told them. And uh, it, it's true. Every day truly is a, a blessing to us. So I am blessed to be here. Blessed that you're here this morning. Amen. Look to a neighbor and say, you look better here than you do anywhere else. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, y'all look good this morning. Hey, Amen. Fantastic. And um, I know we've got, uh, we got some guests in the house this morning. We've got some, some returning guests this morning. Let's give our guests a hand this morning. <laughs> if this is your first time being with us, Welcome home to Mount Pleasant. If this is not your first time, but maybe second or third or something like that, welcome back home to Mount Pleasant. Amen. Amen. And uh, Sister Tiffany, welcome back home. <laughs> She's, uh, you know, I, I said I've been battling the call for like three or four days. She's had it rough for about two weeks. And uh, we are so glad to have her in the house this morning with us because it ain't the same when you're not here. And that goes for everybody in this place. When, when you're not here, we miss you. Just, just know that. So, Amen. All right. Well, let's get in the Word this morning. If you got your Bibles, uh, I'm going to be coming out, out of John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I'd like to say a big thank you to Dylan Nation for working on our computer back there this morning. And uh, let's give him a hand. Start on verse 1 this morning. Verse 1. John chapter 3, verse 1. If you've got it in your Bible, say amen. amen. If it's on the screen, say amen. amen. If you're not paying attention, say amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. If we can't laugh in church, then something's wrong, right? This is a place where we should be able to come and have a good time also. So, amen. John chapter 3, uh, starting with verse 1, I'm going to be reading down through verse 7. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now notice... When we were talking a while ago, we said that, that you know, at Watson Mill, that we go out there and that people stop what they're doing and they watch, right? And I want you to know that, that people, people will watch a move of God a lot of times and it can do one of several different things. It can cause them to move. It can cause them to wonder if they should move. And it could cause them to wonder, why did I not move? Why did I not move? Because there's so many times that God wants to do something in our life, and He's just waiting on us to move. Amen. Right? He's waiting on us to take action. Yes. See, He's going to take some action on our part. Now, um, oh, look, she's here. Hey, baby. <laughs> See, uh, Ellis is playing softball. For the first time, and she's in rookie league, and and she didn't she didn't play like any t-ball or coach fish or anything like that. So I kind of got a late late start on, on working with her. And I tell you what, I've seen this in several movies before, but if if you don't know the game of baseball, a lot of times people don't understand. You know, if there's a runner on first and somebody hits the ball, that that, that you know if it's on the ground, then that runner has to run. The runner has to go from first to second. They're like, why does he have to run? Why can't he just stay there? Well, that's because somebody else is coming to occupy that bag, right? Because when you hit the ball, you don't just stand there. You've got to move, right? And it causes everybody else to move. Now, of course, there's rules and regulations and stuff like that. And then I'm trying to work on whether, you know, if, 
it's not hit on the ground, if it's in the air, you know, stay put, you know, until, you know, you see it through the infield, right? And uh, Brother Lee Fight can come up here and explain this so much better than me with all his awesome experience and everything. But um, sometimes if you're just telling somebody that, if you're just telling it to them, they can't picture it in their head, right? And, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm one of those type of people that, you know, imagery and seeing something helps me out a lot. And that's why, you know, it's, it's so popular nowadays that if somebody's going to do something, um, if you're going to do something on your own or something like that, a lot of times people, they, they Google or YouTube how to do this, right? And they pull up a video and there's somebody showing y'all how to do it. Um, I, was, uh, I was messing around last night and I was thumbing through Instagram and uh, I like to see funny stuff on there, you know, and I came up to, to one guy, and he was doing a uh, car trick. How many of y'all like car tricks? I like them. And uh, I like to, I'm one of the type of people that I like to know how to do the car trick, right? Because, you know, so many times we go and we see people do this magic and these car tricks, and we're looking, we're like, wow, how do they do that? And some people just say, wow, how do they do that? I'm the type, of, I want to go find out. I'm like, okay, literally, how did they do that? Because I would be able to do it. So I'm watching this guy do this car trick, and I'm looking at it, and it kind of blew my mind. And I'm like, there, there's no way that that works. There's no way. So what did I do? I went and pulled out a pack of cards last night. And so I'm sitting there, you know, doing everything that he did, you know, and all this stuff. And, and I'm watching it. I'm watching how he does stuff and everything like that. And sure enough, it worked. Now, if somebody would have tried to explain how to do that card trick to me without having a deck of cards in front of me or a video of somebody doing it, no way. But the fact that I saw somebody doing it, the fact that I saw something with my own eyes, it made it to where I could understand what was going on. I understood what was happening. And here in this passage, we see that Nicodemus, this Pharisee, it says that he came to Jesus by night. And it says that when he came to him, he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. That means that this man had saw something, right? He had saw Jesus do something. And I want you to know this morning that we're going to have people that come into this church and, and they're going to be looking for something. And, and so many times... You know, people, when they come in, you know, they want to see people worshiping. They want to see God moving. But I want you to know right now that when they see those things, it will cause them to move as well. It will cause them to move. And so it's important that when we come into the house of God, that we're ready to worship, right? That if we're expecting something. We come in hungry. That we want God to move. Yes. Come on. Amen. You know, literally, you know, I, I've heard of some people, ooh, I'm not going to say who told me this. And this wasn't the reasoning, but I was talking to somebody the other day that, that they go and they, they preach at different places and it said that they were approached by somebody after they got done speaking and said, hey, you know, can you kind of try and keep it within this time frame? Can you imagine telling God, hey God, we got, we got about 15 minutes for you. After that, we're cutting you off. God's going to cut us off real quick. Yeah. You know, a move of God doesn't have a time frame. Amen. You know, if God wants to move in this place, and, and God forbid, I know that I'm back in so much right now. All right, I know that people are thinking about what they're going to go eat um, and what they're going to fill their bellies with right now. But I want you to know God's got something so much more for you than anything that that restaurant can offer. Amen. Amen. And so you've got to want a move of God if you're going to see a move of God. This, this man, Nicodemus, he wanted something more. He wanted something more. And, and I, I want to tell you all this. I know that, that God has placed me as the shepherd of this church. And, and a lot of people might think, well, you know, he's the pastor, you know, and, and, and all this stuff. I want you to know that I don't have enough God inside of me. I want more. I want more of God. I want as much God as he wants to give me. And if we'll open ourselves up to allow God to pour into us, he will do exactly that. He will continue to pour into you. He'll continue to, you know, give you more. And this man, he wanted more. He says, Jesus, in verse 3 here, it says, Jesus answered and said to him, 
Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, I'm not colorblind, but can y'all tell me what color those words are on that screen right there? Amen. They're in red. That means who said these words? Jesus. Y'all can be mad at me all you want to. You can say, well, Levi was spouting some nonsense this morning. That came right from Jesus' mouth. And you know what? I'm not going to discredit any part of this Bible. You know, you've got to either believe all of it or none of it. Amen. All of it or none of it. Right. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. Jesus definitely does not contradict himself. And Jesus says right here, he says that you cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless you were born of the water and you were born of the spirit. And when he told Nicodemus that you must be born again, it blew his mind, right? Because Nicodemus is thinking, you know, well, you know, am I supposed to, you know, go and be in my mother's womb a second time? I'll go ahead and tell you, as big as I am, yeah, my mama said that ain't working. She's going to have to have more surgery than this on her knee. Um, we're going to have to put her down. Um, but, uh, you know, he was trying to fathom, you know, he was trying to picture what Jesus was talking about. And Jesus had to paint a picture for him, right? They didn't have YouTube and Google and stuff back then, you know. Jesus said, you know what, I'm going to try and paint a picture for Nicodemus so he can understand what I'm talking about. That he knows that I'm not talking about going back in your mother's womb again. But I'm talking about being born spiritually again of the water and of the spirit. And he says here in verse 7, he says, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Don't marvel at it. You know, when, when I looked up that word marvel, that word marvel, it means like astonished, right? And when you're astonished by something, just like I was, you know, the car trip, I was wondering, well, how in the world does that work? You know, I, I don't understand it. You know, I want to understand it, but it's kind of blowing my mind right now, you know, how did he do that? Well, I want you to know that God has given us instructions on how we can receive salvation. And if you want to receive salvation, you can get in the Word of God and you can read scriptures like this that we just read, where God gives specific commandments. See, in that verse 7 right there, I made the word MUST in all caps. Now, a lot of times we don't like being told what we must do, right? Sometimes that doesn't sit well with us. That's that flesh, you know, that's trying to rise up and say, ain't nobody going to tell me what I must do or what I got to do. I'll do what I want to do, right? Well, I can go ahead and tell you, go ahead and do what you want to do, and it'll run you all the way to hell. Or you can do what God has told you you must do. And he's not asking us much. He's not. You know, it says, you know, in my, and, I, and I quote this scripture a lot, but it's just so important that we remember this, that, you know, it says that, that God is, is looking for people that will be a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice to him. And it says that this is our reasonable service. God's not asking you to do anything unreasonable. He's just asking you to make him first. If you'll put him first, he'll put you first. I promise you. He's got more blessings than you could ever imagine. He wants to pour his spirit out amongst you. He wants to, to pour into, you know, your home, your family, your work, you know, your career, whatever it is you do. He wants to be a part of each and every single bit of it so that he can bless everything you put your hand on. But we've got to, we've got to understand that there's a process. There's a process. There's a there's an order to things, so to speak. And Jesus said here, he says, first off, 
you got to be born again. Well, how can somebody be born again if they don't die first? Now, I'm not, I'm not, don't, anybody get the wrong picture. I'm not telling you to go take your life this morning. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about this morning is you have to die out spiritually to this flesh. You got to die out to sin in order to get a rebirth. And we're going to talk about some passages here this morning where I'm going to, you know, try to paint a picture for you or allow the Bible to paint a picture for you, the Word of God, so that you can see what this rebirth is all about. And, you know, I told you that I'm one of those type of people that I, I try to figure things out. That's one of my shortcomings and one of my failures as a child of God because, you know, it's not for me to try and figure everything out all the time. You know, what God has wanted me to do is just trust Him. Just trust Him. You know, it says in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. We've got to trust Him this morning. And if you trust Him, you'll be obedient. Because we've got to understand it. He's not going to send you down a path that would hurt you. He's not going to ask you to do anything that's, that's too unreasonable. You know, I want to talk to you for just a moment here this morning about some key words. And those key words in my title this morning are suddenly, must, and immediately. Let's say those together. Suddenly, must, immediately. Let's do it one more time. Suddenly, must, and immediately. Now, I don't know about y'all, but this sounds like my childhood. Right here. Boy, if I didn't do something that my parents told me to do it, man, snap the finger or give me the look. Y'all know what look I'm talking about, right? Ellis, you get that look sometimes, don't you? Yeah. Because when we ask, when we ask our children to do something, we don't want to have to ask five times, do we? We don't want to have to say that many five times and, and then get all frustrated and then you know, have to go snatch them up and say, and then you're not even mad you know, about what hasn't been done. You're mad that they're not listening to you, right? And, and I feel like that's how God is with us sometimes. He's sitting here calling her, mate. Right? He's saying, hey, you need to go do this. Now, if y'all are anything like me, and I've said this before, I do have bad hair. All right. I will I'll agree. And I probably need to go get uh, um, hearing aids. I probably do. But I'm not going to right now. <laughs> That's just me. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. But, I mean, I've, I've worked around saws my whole life. You know, now I work in a shop where there's, you know, loud noises in the shop. And, um, you know, I, I do probably, you know, have some hearing loss there. But I also suffer from what a lot of men suffer from, and it's called selective hearing. <laughs> I think all the women in the house just said amen. Like, I don't know if any guys said amen. But guys just know y'all are a good company. And uh, we'll have our schedule meeting next Thursday. So. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, man. I was hoping one of the guys would say, heard that. You know what I mean? <laughs> At least we can hear something, right? And, you know, sometimes, I'll be real, I come home from work and I sit down on the couch and I get all comfortable and, and maybe I can hear, you know, Casey hollering from, like, you know, the other side of the house. And I'm like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I ain't getting up right now. <laughs> and, and I figure, I figure, I'm going to say, look, if she really wants me to do something or if she really needs me, She'll, she'll come and get me, all right? She'll come and stand right in front of me. And, you know, it, it, has, it has changed from one of these things to where, you know, when, when she does, you know, march in there, that, you know, she used to say, you know, can you not hear me? I've been calling her name, you know, for like five minutes. I'm sorry, baby. I wasn't paying attention. 
I'm getting myself in trouble because I told her, look, she told me that I run the bus over her all the time, so I'm going to take the bus this morning, all right? So, but now she'll come to me and she'll, she'll come up and she'll go, I know you hear me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because, and it's because, this is why, it's because she is, she's understanding my hearing's not quite as bad as it was because we'll, we'll be somewhere and, and I'll be like, you hear that? And she goes, now how can you hear that and you can't hear me yelling across the house? <laughs> Are y'all following me this morning? Amen, bro. God, <laughs> God is looking at us sometimes. And he's saying, you're hearing all this other stuff. You're paying attention to all this other, these other things. You're tuning in to Facebook. You're tuning in to, you know, Instagram. You're tuning in to, you know, Google and all this other stuff and TV, but you can't hear me. And the bigger problem is that sometimes we don't want to hear him. We choose not to hear God when he's calling us. I'm telling you this morning, he's only been a call for so long before he moves on. And he, he goes on to somebody that will serve him. Somebody that will be obedient. Because I'm going to be real with you this morning. I know that Brother Michael, you named off a lot of awesome names that God did great. He did great things to those those people that you named off. But I can go ahead and tell you that if David wouldn't have stepped up against that giant, God would have found somebody. That's right. And they would have received the blessing that David was supposed to get. And I told y'all this, I can't remember if it was this past Wednesday night or, or last Sunday morning. I don't want somebody else getting my blessing. Right. I don't want somebody else getting your blessing. I don't want somebody else having what God intended for you to have. So we've got to be obedient. Now, Jesus, Jesus is telling Nicodemus this, and I want us to understand this morning that, that Jesus wasn't one of those type of leaders that, that he told people what to do and didn't do it himself. Jesus practiced what he preached. You know, it says in Matthew 3, it says that Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. See, he told Nicodemus that he needed to be born by the water. So Jesus knew that he needed to be born by the water, that he needed to be water baptized, that that was a necessity. Because that's what that word means, right? Must. Must means a commandment of necessity. You've got to do it. You've got to. It says in verse 14 there, it says, And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? Now, I can understand John's position here, because John knew who Jesus was. John knew that, that this was the Messiah, that this was the promised one, that this was the, the one that was going to defeat sin. He knew it. And I can tell you, if, if I was in John's same shoes, I would have did the same thing, like, no, you got this backwards. But see, Jesus needed somebody to baptize him. And it says, Jesus answered in verse 15, it says, and said to him, permit it, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he followed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, a voice come from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I'm going to ask you all a question this morning. I want you to be honest with me. How many of y'all love Jesus this morning? Amen. Amen. If we love him, we've got to want to please him. And we've got to understand that it's not about pleasing ourselves all the time. Amen. It's about pleasing God. And I love here that when Jesus, when he went down in that water, and when he came back up, it says that the heavens were open to him. And it says the Spirit of God descended like a dove upon him. And suddenly that voice came down from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. If you love Jesus, if you want to please him, then what's stopping you? 
What's stopping you? I don't know everybody's background here this morning. I don't know that, I don't know if you've been baptized before. I don't know if you've been baptized, you know, twice or three times. I don't know. But I want you to know that when you're out there walking around in the world, you're going to get dirty from time to time. You know, when you're out there and, and you know, and you're around, you know, darkness and, and maybe you're not, you know, walking with God, you know, you're, you're going to encounter some things that are, that are going to affect you. And God is asking us, if this is your first time, he's asking you to commit to him, to trust him. But maybe you've been out there and, and the world's had its way with you and, and you feel like, you know what? I need to recommit. I want you to know that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I told our people here before that, you know, one of the frustrating things with, with kids sometimes is that, you know, you go give them a bath and, and all of a sudden, you know, they get loose and, and get back into something and get dirty again, right? And what do you do? You bathe them again. You bathe them again. You clean them back up. And I love there that, you know, it's that, that analogy of a child. Because that's what we are. We're children of God. And sometimes we get caught up in stuff that we never should have been involved in. And God's not there to punish us. God, just like that child, he wants to reach down, pick us up, and clean us back up and set us back where we were supposed to be. Now, there's a whole other side of this that we're going to read about here in a second. You know, there was a mighty move of God that we read about in the book of Acts. And I love that the name of this book is called Acts. Because it's going to take action. It's going to take action from us if we want to receive a mighty move of God. But it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there's that word, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I want you to know that they were in this upper room when this happened, and that room could not contain them anymore. And this party, it busted out into the streets, right? Well, when they got out of the streets, everybody started to look around and they're like, what in the world is going on? You know, something's happening. You know, we you know we don't know what's going on right now. They wanted to figure out because, let's be real, how many of y'all are curious like me and you, you want to find out what, what happened, right? I was talking to my boss earlier this week. He said there was a, a day that uh, him and his son, just during the middle of the day, on a Saturday, but they were downtown and they were eating at a restaurant and said when they were walking there, this huge people just started running. And it said that it freaked them out at first. They were like, you know, what, 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 what's going on? They were curious. What's happening? And so he went and asked somebody. He said, you know what's going on out there? Because he said people were literally running down the sidewalks. Like running. And he asked the guy at the restaurant they were at, he said, yeah, he said, R.E.M.'s doing a pop-up concert at Georgia Theater right now. Just decided to pop up and play with them. And people were running. You know, I begin to think, you know, how awesome would it be for people to hear about Jesus, to experience Jesus, and if, when they heard that there was an opportunity to be in the presence of Jesus, that they would run. It would cause them to run. It would cause them to act. That's what these people here on the day of Pentecost 
this is what happened to them. Because they saw something awesome that was happening. They saw something unlike anything they'd ever seen before. And it says that, and I preached a sermon on this in our circle a while back, that, that you know, a lot of times when things happen, there's two types of people. There's the curious and there's the critical. There were people that were critical. They said, oh, these people are drunk. Because can't nobody have a good time without alcohol, right? Wrong. I want to tell you, you get some of Jesus in you, and it'll be unlike anything you've ever had to drink, anything you've had to smoke, anything. And then it, it'll be unreal. And it'll change your life. It'll change your life forever. And so there were there were these people that said these men must be drunken. They spoke up and said, no, these men aren't drunk as you suppose, because it's just the third hour of the day. These men, these women, they were filled with new wine. They were filled with this spirit of God that he had promised that he was going to send down. And so they were the critical, but then they were the curious. And it says that the group of these men in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, it says when they heard this, they came under deep conviction and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what must we do? You know, it says in the King James Version of this passage, it says that their hearts were pricked. Their hearts were pricked. Have you ever had something prick your heart before? And it caused you to want to act? You know, we talked about last Sunday. You know, we talked about the less fortunate. And, you know, there's so many people that, that I see around that they're hurting. And it pricks my heart. And, it's, and it begins to make me want to do something about it. To want to try and help. You know, if, if you see something on TV, I guess my heart got pricked last night wanting to know how to do that car trip. Because I was like, I got to figure this out. You know, there's so many different things that can prick our hearts. You know, you know whether it's, you know, you see a car that you want or, um, you know, I mean, it could be anything. Whatever your hobby is, you know, you, you see something that, that you really want to have, you begin trying to figure out how can I have this, right? How can I receive what it is that I want? And that's what these men experienced here. It says that their hearts were pricked, and they, they asked Peter and the people there, it says, brothers, what must we do? What must we do? Remember, we said the word must, that it was a necessity, a command of necessity. And this is where Peter began to speak to them. And in verse 38, he said, Repent. Peter said to them, Be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promises for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved. From this corrupt generation. Be saved. If you go back to verse 38 there. There's three things that Peter says. There's three commands. There's an order. It says repent. So many times people get repentance. They get it so wrong. Because a lot of people think repenting. Is just saying I'm sorry. See, repentance is so much more than just saying I'm sorry. You know, how many times have you said you're sorry for something that you didn't really feel sorry for? A lot of times people say they're sorry because they got caught. You know, they, they, they're sorry they got found out. But inside, they're, they're you know, really not tore up about it. It didn't affect them. But see, when you repent, there is a saying I'm sorry but repentance is a turning away from it and going the other way. Doing a 180 and walking away from it. So I want you to think about that this morning. What are some things that are holding you back that you need to turn away from and you need to walk the other way?
Do you need to repent this morning? Once you have repented, true repentance, once you truly repented, it says be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Notice that's when the forgiveness takes place. Right there. Jesus said, okay, you said you're sorry. Let's see if you're going to act on it. Let's see if you're going to go down in the water and take on my name. And then that's when the forgiveness takes place. You know, there's a song that we, we sing around here. We've sang it for years. And, and a lot of times we sing it when, when there's baptism taking, taking place. It's called Water Grave. And, and some people might think, well, you know, that sounds kind of scary. You know, a grave, you know. The reason it's called a water grave is because when you go down in that water, you're coming up somebody new, right? It says in 2 Corinthians that we're made a new creation in Jesus Christ. See, that old person that you used to be, he's not alive anymore. She's not around anymore. And when you come up out of that water, you're a new creation in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to be real with you this morning. There's a lot of people that get the first step wrong, and it messes up the second step. Because for the people that just said, I'm sorry... And they didn't have a true turning of the heart or a turning of the mind. And they said, you know what, I'm going to be baptized. You know what happened? They got dunked down and they just came up a wet sinner. That's all that happened. They didn't come up a new creation. See, God's got to touch your heart. He's got to touch your mind. There's got to be a change. And it says there, it says that when you were baptized... And you were forgiven forgiveness of your sins. It says you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, God wants to live inside of you. God wants you to have the same power that He has. Amen. He wants to share with you. Amen. He wants to give you that power to overcome anything. He wants to give you that power that it talks about that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Right. That you don't have to worry about it because nothing can touch you. Because we've got Jesus running through our veins. Now, I said earlier that it's important that we understand that, you know, not everybody has been baptized before, but maybe you've been baptized a long time ago and you need to be rebaptized or you want to be rebaptized and you want to recommit to God. I want you to know that, that I'm one of those people. Yes. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, and this might, this might make some of you think, oh, gosh, you know, this is the guy we trust to be our pastor. <laughs> I'm not any better than anybody. You know, I, I'm not. So I'm going to tell you this morning that, you know, I was baptized when I was 14 years old. And I was baptized in a swimming pool. And it was, it was cold. You talk about that polar plunge we did too. We did too many of the polar plunge. One time when that was a thing, that was so stupid. Yeah, that was a long time ago. It's sometimes people will do some stupid things, you know, just because, you know, it's it's what's in right now. Hey, let's make a video of us jumping in the lake that's freezing cold. That sounds like a good way to get pneumonia. We were on last week, but not the young part, the dumb part. I'm not so young anymore. But I got baptized when I was 14. And, you know, I go through high school, go through college, and get married, become the youth pastor here, you know, at, at this church. Um, I believe I was maybe 24 or 25 when, when that took place. And when I was 28 years old, I was sitting here in a service. And. I had one of those heart prick moments. I had one of those moments that God spoke to me. He said, hey, he's talking about you. And immediately, I'm going to be real with you this morning. Immediately, I start feeling these, having these feelings inside. And, and almost like I'm hearing these voices saying, no, nah, he ain't talking about you. You don't need to, you don't need to go do that. You don't need, you know, this isn't for you. You've already been baptized. 
You know, you, you, you took care of business. Let's see, there was more business that needed to be taken care of. And it, God pricked my heart so strong that morning that I got baptized, rebaptized right there on the spot at 28 years old. And people might have thought, why is the youth pastor being baptized? That's kind of weird. You know what? I had unfinished business. I had been a business that needed to be taken care of. And I'm telling you here this morning, and I'm not trying to scare anybody. I don't use scare tactics when I preach, but you're not promised tomorrow. And you need to take care of business today. Because I'm going to tell you another story. When I was, this is, this is years after this, we were doing a disciple now here at the church. It's our big youth retreat that, that we, you know, did. And we had a prayer service that Saturday night. And Timmy, I think you were here for this, where God just moved on these, these kids, and it was just amazing. And between that night and the next morning, we baptized 13 of them in Jesus' name. And that's incredible. And, and I'm not one of those type of people that, you know, if, if, if there's a huge whiteboard and there's one little white dot on it, that you tell people, what do you see? And a lot of people say, well, there's that one little black dot. And 99% of the board is white. I'm not one of those type of people. But something stuck with me that weekend. It is, it's really stuck at me ever since then. There was a young man there on that Saturday night, and he wanted to be baptized. And y'all got to understand that there's an order to the things. You know, so I told him, I said, this, this, this kid, you know, if you're 16 or older, I'll, I'll do it. But I said, call your parents and make sure that it's okay. Because the last thing I need is mom and daddy walking up here, you know, you know, calling for my head. And, and so he called his parents. Because he was 14, 13 at the time, something like that. And his parents told him, they said, we can't make it out there tonight, so we don't want you to be baptized tonight. And I said, okay. I said, well, you know, how about tomorrow morning? You know, you know, all the kids are staying after we're going to baptize tomorrow, tomorrow morning. They said, well, his grandparents can't be there tomorrow, so uh, no, we're, we're not going to do that. And I just said, I, you know, I, I, just, I, I prayed, and, um, and, I, and I let it go. And uh, I wasn't going to do anything against their wishes. That's just me. I, you know, I, I respect, I respect parents and, and their beliefs and everything like that. And the thing is, is, there wasn't one single time that they told me we don't believe in that, or you know, we don't think that he should do it or anything like that. It was an inconvenience because they couldn't be there that night, and other people couldn't be here the other night. I want you to know that baptism is not about your mom and dad. It's not about your grandparents. It's not about your friends. Baptism is about you and your relationship with God. And you need to act on it when He calls you. You need to act on it right then. To this day, that young man is still not been baptized. And that was back in 2017. And it tears my heart up. It does. Don't let anything stop you. It doesn't matter who is here, who's not here. We we got cameras. We'll take pictures and we'll video. I promise. We can send it to people. But you make sure you do what God has called you to do, and you don't wait on somebody else. It says in Acts nineteen, verses one through five. It says, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? Now notice, these people had already been baptized. So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, 
saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. See, these people, they were rebaptized. I want you to know, rebaptism is not a bad thing. You'll have a lot of preachers preach against it, but I'm telling you right now, there is nothing wrong with recommitment. And God's not looking up there saying, you know, you don't need to be rebaptized. I can go ahead and tell you right now that if somebody feels the urge within them that they need to recommit and that they need to be rebaptized, God's going to be up there celebrating. Because you know what? That's a son or a daughter that's decided to come back home. Amen. Amen. God's looking for our action. He's looking for us to move. And he wants to bless us. If you'll stand with me this morning, I'm going to ask our musicians to come up. There's one more passage that I want to read to you before we open up the altar. And before I read that passage, I'll share a little something with you. And I'm not trying to I'm not trying to, to make him look bad at all because I, I love this dude. But me and Eric, we were both rebaptized on the same day. See, God pricked his heart that same day. He heard the same thing that I heard. Now, this is nothing bad about Eric. It's not at all. It's nothing bad. Eric, as soon as he heard that call, he jumped in his truck and he says, I'm going to get me some clothes and I'm going to be baptized. And that's awesome. That's awesome. I couldn't wait. I was wearing some dress slacks. I was wearing a nice button-down shirt and a tie. I know some of y'all are saying, I can't picture Levi wearing this. I've got the pictures I'll show you sometime. But I got in the water just like that. I said, you know what? I don't care if I get my clothes wet. I got to do this right now. And one of our youth there that morning. Back then she was Casey Wade. Now she's Casey Grimes. She got baptized as well. She didn't She didn't have her clothes with her either. She put a robe on. See, when you feel something so strongly, there won't be any excuses. There won't be anything that's in front of you to say, okay, you know, I can't, I, maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe, maybe I'm not hearing this right. When you feel something so strongly, don't let anything stand in your way. Just act on it. This last passage I want to read is from Acts 16. And this is Paul and Silas. It says, But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Verse 26, Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Don't you love that? that Paul and Silas' worship called everybody's chains to be broke loose, not just their own. It says, And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Because he knew, I'm going to be in trouble. I was in charge when this went down. He says in verse 28, it says, But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Why did he fall down? Because he knew. He knew that he was in the presence of God. He knew that God had just moved in this prison. He says in verse 30, it says, And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? Verse 31, it says, So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him 
and to all who were in his house. See, he wanted not just himself to be saved, he wanted his whole family to be saved. In verse 33, it says, And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Immediately. I want you to know this morning that you might not have felt like you waited a long time, but God's been waiting on you. And if you want a suddenly move of God, there's something that you must do. And that nobody else can do it for you. But I want you to know that when you do what you must do, that there will be an immediate change in your life. And God will move on you and He will do things that you never could have imagined in your life and in your family. He's looking for somebody this morning that will be obedient and say, you know what? That's me. That's me. Yesterday afternoon, I came over here and I cleaned out the baptistry because it needed cleaning. And y'all should have saw the, the water that was in it. It was, it, was, it was pretty nasty, honestly. I got a picture of that too if you want to see it. And I sent it to a couple of people. I said, look at this sin water. All that sin that was in there. And I cleaned out the baptistry and, and we, we filled it. And I, I sent a couple of people you know, some pictures of the baptistry all clean. And I had a few of them say, hey, who's getting baptized? And I said, well, we don't have anybody lined up. I said, but you know what? I want it to be ready. I want it to be ready in case there's somebody, because there's, there's no excuses. There shouldn't be any excuses. See, I told y'all that, that I got baptized on that day. We didn't heat the baptism for that morning, so it was cold. Woo. And there have been a few times that me and Eric had baptized people in there and the heater didn't work that we had planned on it, and it for the matter. You know, there's a part of that verse in Acts chapter 2 that says, with stammering lips, you know, and an unknown tongue, I'll speak to my people, I promise you. When we took Matt down and brought him back up in that cold water, his lips were stammering. <laughs> he was shaking. And, uh, I'm here to tell you this morning, that water is warm in there this morning. It's right. It's ready. Are you ready? The question is, are you ready? Because if you're ready, then we are too. I brought a change of clothes this morning in faith. That somebody was going to say, hey, that's me. Because I wanted to be ready. God wants to get somebody ready this morning to do something great in your life. And I promise you, if you'll be obedient, He'll do something amazing. We've got robes. You don't have to have a change of clothes. We can put you in one of these robes. We'll take you down and you'll be fine. I promise. But don't let the devil lie to you this morning and say, you need to wait. Don't let the excuses that are there you know, my dad told me something from the time I was a young man. He said, if you're looking for an excuse, you're going to find one. You're going to find one. Don't look for the excuses this morning. If your heart's been pricked, just act. Just move. Do what you must do. We're going to open up this altar here in a second. And if there's anybody that needs to come down here, and maybe you just got stuff going on in your life, you know, you don't... You know, maybe you don't feel that urge to be rebaptized. Maybe you just want to come pray for a little bit. Altar's open for you. But if you're somebody in here this morning that says, you know what, I need to repent, this is the place for you. You can come down here and you can give it all to God. And we'd love to meet you in that walk today. Let's pray. Dear God, we just thank you for your word. God, I thank you for giving us the ability to to be born again, God, and, and to feel your spirit, dear God, to experience your presence. God, I pray that right now that you would just begin to move on hearts. 
God, prick them this morning, God. Jesus, you know the ones that are in this place that, that you're calling right now. God, I pray that you would just let us be obedient to that call this morning. And God, I pray that you just begin to draw people to an altar of repentance and to waters of baptism this morning so that you can fill them with your Holy Spirit. God, I thank you for what you're about to do in this place. We give you the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't overthink it, friends. This altar is open for you today. And if you decide that you want to be baptized this morning or rebaptized, just come see me. Come let me know. And we'll get in the water. We'll meet you in there.